So, hi guys, uh, this is uh, 94th talk in the series of QSTM. Today our speaker is Professor Sumati Surya from Brahman Research Institute, Bangalore. Uh, she's going to speak about geometry from order, the, uh, the causal set approach to quantum gravity. Sumati, thank you for uh, agreeing to give this talk. And uh, hopefully we can learn a lot of things from this approach because this was not explained in this forum before. So thank you again, and you can start from your end. Thank you so much for this uh, for this uh, invitation. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, I don't, I can't see any of the other participants, but perhaps that's the way that it is right now. So I will be speaking to. Uh, uh, to, to my computer screen, but it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, Sarantan, thanks for the, the, you know, the fact that I don't have a one hour cutoff or a 45 minute cutoff is brilliant because I hope I can explain a little bit more about the subject to people since uh, typically the introduction is fairly long and by the time one gets to results, one has to rush through it. So I'm very pleased that I'll be able to uh, go go through some of the interesting results in this theory. Um, so causal set theory, um, so let me begin with the outline of the talk. I will begin by discussing um, something about Lorentzian geometry, which is often not uh, fully appreciated or fully sort of thought of in a, in a, in a, as, as being separate from the way we think of space-time. And that is something that we call the causal structure poset. Um, I will then talk about how, when you discretize this causal structure poset in an appropriate way, that's how we um, that's how we think of spacetime in the causal set approach to quantum gravity. So it is a discrete approach to quantum gravity based on the causal structure poset. Um, it's a fairly natural thing in this theory to begin to talk, you know, to divide up the discussion into kinematics as well as the dynamics. Very often one doesn't think of kinematics in terms of recovering space time from the theory. But here this goes into how we define the theory. It's not um, just another theory of uh, partially ordered sets, it's a very specific approach. And so the kinematics becomes very important in how we describe. Uh, the approximation uh, that the continuum, that the conti what we call the continuum approximation. So, uh, so the kinematics is something I'll talk about. It, it involves something that uh, we call geometric reconstruction, which is very interesting from the point of view of Lorentzian geometry. And the idea is that you basically take causal structure as a way in which you understand geometry. So even from the continuum perspective, it's very interesting because it gives you a wholly different way uh, of thinking of Lorentzian geometry from the perspective of causality. Um, and then I will talk about dynamics, um, where, you know, the approaches to dynamics. We, of course, don't have a full quantum theory of causal sets. So these are tentative approaches, tentative thoughts. Um, but of course, we have pursued some of these ideas fairly rigorously and have results in the theory. Of course, we can't say that we've solved quantum gravity using causal set theory. Nevertheless, I think it's a very promising approach and it's a great opportunity to talk to this wider audience about it. And then I'll end with the outlook. So um, let's begin with the simplest spacetime we know, which is Minkowski spacetime. So um, one thing that we know about Minkowski spacetime, which makes it different from other spaces that you encounter is this signature, which is the minus plus 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 signature. In other words, time comes with a different sign, so to speak. And what this does for you is, is that at every point in the space time, you have a light cone structure. So at every such, let me see if I can do this, sorry. Um, uh, yes, at every, you can see this, can't you? Yes, hopefully, yes. So at every point X, we have a light cone structure, which means there's a future directed light cone here, 
a future director like Konya and a past director like Konya. And this means that I can put an order relation on the events in the space time. The order relations that are natural to put in the continuum are causality, which means that if I have a point Y that lies within or on the light cone of X, in other words, there are different ways of saying it, but basically another way of thinking about it is if there exists a time-like curve that goes from X to Y, then I will say that Y is chronologically related to X, and that's the second relation we have here, the second relation here, chronological relation. Um, and of course, I should be a little careful because I should make sure that this curve that I have, the reason I call it time-like is because at every, every point on that curve, the tangent to the curve has signature. The tangent is of, basically is of, its norm is less than uh, zero, okay? We know that when it lies, when you have a point that's on the light cone, then the norm of that vector is zero. Those are null vectors. And so we will call that a null related element. And a causal, causal, causal relation is one that's either null or chronological. Okay, and so we know this about Minkowski space time. And um, when we ask the question, well, okay, there's this order relation, so what? I have right? a question. Sure, sure. Yes. Yeah. So is it uh, like, I can understand this thing, but like, uh, so the, this three plus one dimension that you have written just to give one example or this approach is restricted to only three plus one dimension? Oh, no, no. Uh, in fact, you will see that dimension is not even a constraint in the theory. Oh, okay. So uh, we have, uh, you know, you'll see the richness of, of I'm, I'm beginning from literally the very beginning without any discussion about causal set theory right now. We're trying to tell you what the structures that we know and love, but may not have thought about in quite the same way about Minkowski space time to start with, and then we'll proceed. Yeah. Sure. So, um, so what I can do with what can I do with this uh, cause uh, this order relation? What does it say? If I think about it, I know that because of the fact that cause that you know light cones are nested one inside each other, like like this, like this, they're nested one inside each other, that there is some more property about the causal order relation, okay? Um, so in particular, one of the things that we know in Minkowski space-time is that if X precedes Y and Y precedes X, that means that X precedes Y and Y precedes X, that's really not possible unless they're one in the same point, okay? Um, so there is a direction to causality, okay? I can try to draw it here. There's a direction to causality. You can't change the arrow, that's not allowed, okay? So you can't, you can't make the arrow the opposite way. Once you pick a direction, you have to stick with that direction, okay? That's the direction to causality. And moreover, you have this property of transitivity, which is this nesting property, I said, of the, of the light cones, which is that this light cone of Y is nested inside the light cone of X. So its future is such that therefore that if X, so I've written it here, if X precedes Y and Y precedes Z, then X precedes Z. And this is uh, essentially uh, that statement. And in the continue, we also know that if I have an X and Y, which are related to each other, then I can always find an intermediate Z which lies between the two, okay? That's the continuum. But if I take the first two properties, I notice the following, that there's a mathematical structure which is known, studied by mathematicians for X, Y, Z reasons. And that is that the first condition says that you have acyclicity, which means there's no, in our causal language, there are no closed time-like curves. And the second is that it's transitive and that's this nesting property, okay? This makes this object a partially ordered set or poor set, okay? And this is just Minkowski space-time. Now, when I come to a generic space-time, I can ask the same question. And for a generic space-time, I want to make sure that what I have is 
a light a signature of minus plus plus again and of course uh, i'm only stopping at uh, you know dimension three spatial dimension three but it could go on forever as long as the signature is of this kind okay um and the point is that at for any space time, because of the equivalence principle or the geometric realization of the equivalence principle, at every point, things look approximately Minkowski, which means that there's a local future and a local past light cone at every point. So if I take this point here, there's a local future and a local past, okay? So let me take this point, local future, local past, okay? Um, and then I have this relation that, uh, if x precedes y, x precedes y, if there's a future directed curve from x to y, that is a curve whose tangent is of this sort. But does that mean that, um, does that mean, so sorry, I should have written here. So the question is, is it, does this and And that's the question you can ask. Well, is that still true? And here's an example which I've written here, which is an example where that isn't true. So in other words, if I have X and I have Y, right? X precedes Y, but then because I'm allowing a closed time like curve this way, I can see the y is also before x. So I'm allowing closed time by curves. And in general, general relativity doesn't prohibit such space times because it's a local field equation. These are global causality conditions. So if I have a, if I have a space time that violates causality, then that condition is no longer satisfied. So sorry, I should have actually uh, put in some other conditions here. One is the, so the, the tick mark is for whether it satisfies transitivity, sorry. And of course it does trans, uh, satisfy transitivity, but what it does not satisfy is this condition here, okay? So what we can ask is, well, what if you restricted, so, Causal structures can be very many things like cones tilt around in a generic space time, but at one end of the spectrum is when you actually violate causality. So you can violate causality, almost violate causality. These are conditions called strong causality and so on. But if you actually violate causality, those space times allow you to do things which don't respect causality, strictly don't respect causality. And that's something that you might say in your theory you don't want to have. Um, and so that's that's how if you can if you say that you want to restrict space times to those that satisfy causality, then you find that the causal structure poset that you have, that the causal structure that you have actually forms a poset. So if you add in that one extra condition for any generic space time, not just Minkowski space time, any generic space time in any dimension, as long as the signature is minus plus plus so on and so forth you're going to have a causal structure poset so in other words associated with every causal space time is a partially ordered set which is m with the order relation uh, which i denote this way m here the important thing is that it's a set because it, this m is only the set of events so earlier when we think about the space time of mg we think about M with its topological, all of its differential structure, all of that. And now you can think of it stripped of all that information with just an ordering relation between the events, okay? Now, the important thing is that this causal structure poset is in fact very important. It's like the thumbprint, if you like, of Lorenzian geometry. Um, and it's absent, such a post set is absent in any other signature. And here's an example where I've suppressed, um, here's an example where I have minus, minus, plus, plus signature, but of course I can't draw a four dimensional object. So here I have a three dimensional object, which I've, where I've suppressed one extra spatial direction. So here I have what I would like to call two time directions. And you see immediately that the topology of it is such that 
the future life cone is not different from the, there's no future that's distinguished from the past. It's a continuum. And so there's no way in which to order the events in such a space time. So in other words, if you have this particular signature, which is a minus plus plus signature, then associated, only associated with that is a causal structure post set. Okay, and this is the important thing. Another thing you notice is that because, you see, if I look at the light cones and I look at the fact that I have these null, you know, the boundary of the night light cone corresponds to null directions, what we call light-like directions or null directions, then under a conformal transformation, basically where you take the metric and you take an overall factor, uh, you know, a function which you multiply that metric with, then under that, the null vectors don't change. And because of that, that tells you that the light cones remain the same under a conformal transformation. Again, this is an important thing. So very early on, people began to ask the question, well, this is very important in Lorentzian geometry. It was not there when you thought about Riemannian geometry or any other signature. It's very special to Lorentzian geometry. And the question is, how primitive is this causal structure post set? Okay. Um, so in Kronheimer and Penrose's 1967 paper, um, they call this the essence of Lorentzian geometry. And we think of causal structure as the essence. And earlier than that, uh, uh, Zeeman, not the Zeeman that people know from quantum mechanics, a different Zeeman, um, stated the following about Minkowski space time. He said, if you take chronological automorphisms, in other words, you take Minkowski space time and you know, another copy of Minkowski space. I mean, you just look at the map between these two, it's an automorphism, so between the same manifold, manifold and itself, same space-time and itself, such that that map preserves the chronology relation, which is the time-like relation, then that group of transformations is in fact the same as a group of conformal transformations that includes, for example, the Poincaré group and so on and so forth. So that's already got various people thinking about how primitive is this? There seems to be a lot of information in the causal structure. And finally, Hawking, King, McCarthy, and then Malament basically proved a very important theorem, which I would say is the basis or the found sort of the motivating, mot main motivation behind causal set theory, which is that if you have two causal space times, okay, and you have two, you look at their order, you know, the causal structure post set, M1 uh, order relation one, M2 order relation two. And if F maps one to the other, in a way that that map is a bijection, which means it's one to one and on to, then um, if such a causal bijection, in fact, the actual theorem talks about chronological, but it's equivalent to a causal bijection, then what you find is that they're also those two space times. If all you had is a post set structure, you had no other information, just the set theoretic post set structure, and you found that there's a bijection between the two, then those two space times are in fact related by a conformal transformation. So this is a very deep theorem because it's telling you that the causal structure contains a lot of information, okay, about the space-time. And maybe this is a way to think about space-time rather than as just a generalization, a sort of weird generalization of Riemannian geometry, which is how you think about it. You call it pseudo-Riemannian and so on and so forth, okay? And these are just sort of technical things of what, what kind of, when does this theorem apply and so on. Uh, we also showed that if you don't assume a fixed dimension for these space times from which these causal structures arise, then also that those, uh, it also determines the, the, the dimension. So if there is such a causal bijection, the dimensions are also the same. So, and so the topology and so on and so forth. So these are, this is a very, very deep theorem. And if you think about it a little bit more, you can think of space-time as basically saying, okay, the conformal structure, which is this causal structure poset, 
plus something more. What is that extra thing? It's that conformal factor sitting in front. And we all know, having done GR, that that conformal factor is basically the local volume element, okay? So in other words, what we're saying is take a space time, MG, and split it up, think of it in a very different way than most you're mostly used to, which is the causal structure per set plus this extra local volume element, okay? Uh, Shantan, are you, uh, is this, uh, I hope the volume is okay. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. All right. So um, one of the things, the quips that Finkelstein had even before this theorem, because people are beginning to feel that this must be true somehow before they actually could go ahead and prove it, is that if you think in four dimensions, the causal structure is nine tenths of the space-time metric. And that's a really startling way of saying it. It's basically everything but one scalar, right? Which is a conformal factor. Um, and what is interesting is when you go back to Kronheimer and Penrose's paper is that they say that the reason they study and they axiomatize, basically they axiomatized the idea of causal structure. They said, what is it that a causal space should look like? Forget about talking about space time, just have events and an order relation. And the reason they went about it even way back then was to say, was basically to admit structures which can be very different from a manifold. The possibility arises, for example, of a locally countable or discrete event space equipped with causal relations macroscopically similar to those of a space-time continuum. Okay, and that's essentially what I will say is what the causal set hypothesis is taking off from, okay? And here's a quote from Mark Katz. Uh, you know, it's one of those quotes that is just repeated by word of mouth and it's not written anywhere, but it seems to be something that he said. And so what is a causal structure hypothesis? What is a causal, sorry, what is a causal set hypothesis? It was laid forth uh, by Bombelli, Lee, Meyer, and Sorkin in 1987, but also in many ways, there was many things that were already there in present in a CERN preprint by Mirheim in 1987, uh, 78, sorry. And he found it very hard to convince people of this idea and uh, but a lot of those ideas are there even in his paper but this paper of Bombelli, Lee, Meyer and Stockin basically set out what the program is about. So essentially we have the two things that we have already come across which makes a post set which is acyclicity and transitivity so no closed time like curves and then this nesting property of light cones. We don't have to think in terms of light cones we can just think in terms of this transitivity structure. One of the things I mentioned earlier was that in the continuum between any two points, you always have another, any two events which are related to each other, there's always another event in between them and that's the nature of the continuum. What one is saying here in causal sets is no, we don't want the continuum, we discretize the theory. And so we have something that is locally finite, okay? And the local finiteness says, Okay, and way of thinking about it, at least picturing it is if I have, uh, sorry, um, if I have an interval like this and here, let me call this a point X and a point Y. So here is the future of X and here is a past of Y. And I'm looking at the intersection of the future and the past. These two light cones which are intersecting. These are called Alexander intervals in, um, in Lorenzian geometry. And what we're saying is that such finite space-time volumes should only contain a finite number of fundamental space-time atoms, okay? Which are fundamental space-time events. What does that mean? So if I did this and this, the, those are two events. Between those two events is a space-time volume like this, the one like the one that I've got on my uh, screen. And between those two, events, I want to have only a finite number. Of course, because this is macroscopic, I'm doing this in macroscopically large time. There are a huge number of them, so many, you know, Planck volumes worth of atoms. But the point is this, that that discretization already now changes the nature of the game. For one, what it does is that this discretization gives you this volume element by itself. Okay, so the thesis is that causal set C, which is, is a 
locally, so not the thesis, but just the definition of a causal set is a locally finite poor set. And the idea, the thesis is that that causal set is approximated by a continuum in very much the way that you can approximate the atomic structure of a uh, of fluid by a continuum, by assuming continuum and then looking at, you know, studying Fokker Planck equations, but you know, fundamentally deep down inside it's atomistic, right? It's molecule, whatever, it has molecules there and that's the discrete underlying structure. So we think of space-time in a similar fashion. So space-time is emergent, the continuum is emergent and at the heart of space-time is the locally finite partially ordered set. And the idea is that instead of, um, uh, instead of, so let me just order and number, which corresponds, order corresponds to the causal structure, number corresponds to the volume, is in an approximate sense, the same as space-time. And these are ideas, really, there's a list of people who thought about causal structure being fundamental, and here's a list of various people who contributed to these ideas. But I think in some ways, the causal structure hypothesis was really crystallized in this paper of Bombelli, Lee, Meyer, and Sorkin. And that's what we uh, refer to uh, every time. So let me just reiterate what it, does, what, what it means. Okay? What does it mean for, for me to say that? Uh, to begin with, it says that the fine-grained structure of space-time is that of a causal set. So if you take any continuum space-time at the deepest level, it's going to be some kind of a locally finite partially ordered set. More importantly, that object is going to be, those are the building blocks for your theory. Rather than thinking of continuum space-times, we want building blocks that are made up of partially ordered sets, which are locally finite. So whatever my theory, it's a theory of locally finite partially ordered sets, okay? Now, another very important aspect of our theory, and I call it our theory because I spent a lot of time now working on it, um, is that we also want to know how the continuum arises. In what way should we recognize so I can tell you that, oh, this is actually a locally finite partially ordered set and you do your quantum theory and you get some, some result out of your quantum theory. But when I get that result, how will I recognize it to be anything that I know? How will I know that what I get is something that looks like any continuum space time? In order to do that, in order to also then respect what we learned from Lorentzian geometry, which is that order and number can give us back a space time or in other words, causal structure and the local volume element is the same as the space-time, which is causal. In order to make that correspondence really uh, clear, I need to make a correspondence between order and causal structure, number and volume, okay? And it so turns out, and I don't know if I'll have time to elaborate, we can go into questions later or even now if you want, but essentially if you went, did this, the thing that might occur to you, which is you take a lattice and you, you, know, you say, I'm gonna discretize space time and take a regular lattice and I discretize it. Although I can still have order coming from causal structure, so I can still correlate the two, I will not be able to have a number to volume correspondence that is strictly covariant, okay? In particular, and very simple examples will show you that you can't do that even in Minkowski space time. So in other words, a regular lattice doesn't work for this correspondence to be meaningful. So this correspondence will fail for a regular lattice. So in order for this correspondence to be possible at all, you have to go for a, um, a random lattice and we achieve this through a Poisson sprinkling. Um, Poisson where by that we specifically mean that in a volume V, the probability of putting n that that volume that space time volume v has n elements in it is given by this where rho gives you the density of sprinkling inverse rho is a cutoff that you have your volume cutoff space time volume cutoff that you have and what's important about this also 
it's just of course it's a it's a uniform distribution because it only depends on space time volume etc so it's also lorentz invariant or covariant but it also has a property that on an average the number is given by the volume okay and this extra property that the that the fluctuation in the number is given by square root of rho v also leads to a very interesting thing that if I have time, I will talk about later. Are there any questions so far? No, you just proceed. Okay. So um, let me then just sort of tell you what the structure of the theory is in the sense that, okay, we have these two basic assumptions about the theory, that with basic axioms, I would say, that this is the nature of space-time, you know, fundamentally, it's a locally finite post set, and we ar arrive at the continuum via a Poisson process, okay? That we can only make a correspondence when a causal set can arise as a Poisson sprinkling from a continuum space time, okay? If it cannot, then it does not correspond to that space time, okay? Perhaps it doesn't correspond to any space time, that's also a possibility. So we're going away from space times in general, and we're only looking at the set of all possible locally finite posets. But like I said, it's a natural thing to actually begin to ask, well, all very well that you told me that there's a Poisson distribution and so on, and I can make an order to number correspondence, order to, um, yeah, uh, sorry, uh, uh, number to volume correspondence this way, right? I mean, this, I, it's all very well that you, you're telling me this, but if all I have is this causal structure, this uh, causal set here, just this discrete set of points with relations, how do I know, looking at it, what are the properties of that structure that I have, which will give me information about the continuum? There are many things about the continuum that all of us love and know and are familiar with. There's dimension, there's topology, there's geometry, there's all of that different aspects of geometry. How will I get it all from this, you know, just a set of order relations? I mean, it seems mind bogglingly hard. And it is in many ways, but we have a library now. And that's the study, what I call kinematics. And the question, how does continuum geometry and topology arise from the discrete substratum? Okay. And there are three aspects which I'll go through, which is the Poisson distribution and Lorentz invariance, uh, the fundamental conjecture of the theory, and the examples, which I'll try to explain in somewhat more detail. Um, then there's the dynamics, which, of course, like I said, is something that's definitely a work in progress. We don't understand a lot about the dynamics, but I can tell you the directions that we're going and we're trying to pursue. There's also phenomenology. And I will not say anything about it in today's lecture, but there's some very interesting work. One is the cosmological constant and Sorkin's 1987 prediction for the fluctuation in lambda, which we call a prediction because it actually gives you to the to the minus 120 that was actually observed uh, many years later. And that arises essentially for those of you who might be interested from precisely the fact that one has a Poisson distribution, it's a back of the envelope calculation. There are also other kinds of phenomenology, but today I won't say anything about those. So the first is the fact that even though this is a discrete approach, it still does not violate Lorentz invariance. And that's quite surprising. You might imagine that I've already put in Lorenz invariance by hand, but I haven't. All I've said is that there's a number to volume correspondence. So I've got Minkowski. And so what am I, what am I talking about right now? I'm talking about Minkowski space time on one side and the discrete underlying discrete causal set that is there. And how do these two correlate with each other? One is one you can think of the causal set as a discretization of Minkowski space time. And normally when we think about discretizations, regular discretizations, we know we lose symmetry, right? If I discretize, did a regular lattice, even in, you know, on a plane, I know that I lose the full rotation group. I lose full translation invariance, right? So how is it possible to discretize 
while retaining this. And that comes about because of the Poisson distribution and the fact that it is a uniform distribution, which itself is invariant that the measure, that the measurable sets on this uh, set of possible Poisson, uh, Poisson sprinklings is invariant under Lorentz transformation. So here's a proof, or here's a statement of a theorem a little too involved for me to go into the proof, but again, we can talk about it, which is that if you have Minkowski spacetime and you look at the set of sprinklings into Minkowski spacetime, Poisson sprinklings, okay? Each sprinkling gives you one causal set. And so what you construct is an ensemble of causal sets for a given spacetime. In this case, that spacetime is Minkowski spacetime, okay? So omega here, is the space of all sprinklings into uh, Minkowski spacetime. And then you have a Lorenz invariant measure, which is taking omega into, it's just, some, just a regular measure. So it's a positive, uh, positive definite function and it's taking it into the reals. And then now you also have, and this is the important thing is that because you have it's a Lorentzian spacetime. You know, we, we forget that we always think of things that are close to us as being, you know, spheres. But if you think in the Lorentzian perspective, they're not spheres, they're hyperbole. And this is really the point that the group that you have, which is a group of future directed, uh, you know, unit time like future directed uh, uh, vectors, that space of vectors is the hyperboloid. Uh, and that is, the hyperbola associated to the group SO31, which is non-compact, okay? This is something we keep forgetting. We talk about things that are close to us, but really in special relativity itself, we know that things that are close to us are not necessarily spatially close to us. They could be spatially very far away, but they are in fact, from the point of view of the full space-time metric, you know, very close to us. So that's, so if I take a point here, X, then the set of all, all points that are unit one distance away lie on this green hyperbola, okay? This hyperboloid. And so that entire hyperboloid is of course a non-compact set of directions. And it's because of this, it turns out that you cannot, basically the theorem says there's no measurable map that takes you from the space of sprinklings into the space of directions. And while that's possible in, the, in this red case, which is in the Riemannian case, where you just have a sphere of directions, it's not possible in the Lorenzian case. And that tells you that it's not possible to assign, even in a given sprinkling, even in a given element, a causal set which belongs to that uh, direction. So you don't actually break Lorenz invariance by this discretization. What does happen, however, is that you um, do, um, what, what does happen is that you do give up locality. What you have is a highly non-local structure because just as you can see, the space of future directions is, is basically this uh, entire hyperboloid, which is non-compact, it means that the set of nearest neighbors to the future of any point are therefore infinite in Minkowski spacetime. So it is not a finite valency graph, which makes it a very difficult beast to deal with because in all graph theoretic uh, reconstructions of geometry, you have fixed or finite valency graphs. So this is the technical challenge that it, uh, that it, uh, you know, that it poses. One important uh, aspect of uh, this theory is that is a, something I call the fundamental conjecture, which says that if a causal set is approximated by two different space times, the same causal set is approximated in this particular way, then those two space times, sorry, somehow I've managed to get um, something marked on my screen. Okay. Perhaps it was a mistake, but <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, hi, Shobhana. Um, so 
Yeah, so, so it tells you that those two space times are then almost the same. In other words, they differ only on scales that, that are smaller than the discreteness scale. Yeah, again, I won't be able to belabor this point. So let's ask the question, what kind of things can we reconstruct from the causal order, okay? And the, one of the first things that was done was to ask, well, can we think of time-like distance? You know, like I two events like this. What is the time-like distance between those two events? So um, I'm just going to actually, if you don't mind, just pause this for a second because I need to, I think there's, is there too much noise that's from my, from where I am? Shantan? Yeah. There is some noise? No, no, no. Okay, okay, that's fine. All right, I think because of some, I'm at home, so it's a sort of, uh, anyway. So the idea is that between these two events, uh, you know, I know how to calculate the time-like distance in flat space-time, Minkowski space-time from the geometry, right? I mean, just from, I know what, how to calculate that. How do I do it on a causal set, which is an approximate, which is being approximated by this continuum space-time? And uh, the idea was to take all such, um, so if I take a point here and I take a point here, X and Y, and I look at all you know, things that are connected via relations like this, right? And I've drawn a few and I'm drawing some more. And I look at the one that maximizes the length. Length here is the number of elements there, okay? So this, for example, would be a minimizing curve because it has only one point in between, right? Right. So if something is very null, then it's not, not going to have that many points in between. But the one that sort of wiggles a lot and contains a lot of points is going to be the one that maximizes it. And those are typically in the center around where you find, you know, where you think that the time-like curve should be. And in fact, Brightwell and Gregory way back in 1991 showed that if you looked at the length of the longest chain, uh, it gives you, and you look, average over several, uh, on, you know, do an ensemble average, then that gives you the time-like distance up to a constant, which depends on the dimension, okay? Um, another thing that you might ask is what about the space-time dimension? So, in a, so, so let me just reiterate to say that here we have just an order relation. All we're doing is looking at chains, which are nothing to do with the continuum. They just have to do with the structure of the causal set. And we are just counting the lar and finding the largest one. There may be more than one largest, but that length of the largest on an average will be the one that you um, will give you the time-like distance. Similarly, when you count the number of relations that you have, so anything that's related to X, okay? Um, so if I take a point in particular, if I take a point like this in the middle, uh, or uh, I mean, sorry, I, I don't even need to do that. Let me, just, uh, let me just count all the possible relations, this relation, this relation, so on and so forth. I haven't drawn in the relations, not all possible relations in the causal set. Then, that relation turns out that number of relations to the number of possible relations on n elements, which is the number of elements here, gives me a measure of the dimension, okay? When I have Minkowski space-time, then I will get the Minkowski space-time dimension from that. So just again, counting is enough to give you geometry. And this is what's fascinating about this. For those of you who love Lorenzian geometry, this is really amazing that you can get important information about space-time and the continuum just through order relations. There are many examples of this, and I'm going to actually just focus on a few uh, in the time permitting. And um, Shantan, how, you know, I know you're not strict, but you must cut me off and tell me, okay, you're really tired when you're done. You can proceed, no problem. So, okay, all right. All right, so one of the things that's very challenging in causal sets because of this non-locality that we have and because of the randomness of, the, of these, uh, uh, of these uh, 
of the sprinkling is to construct or reconstruct spatial information, which we're of course used to in GR. We define things in terms of initial values and so on. We talk about globally hyperbolic space times where you have you know, a Cauchy hypersurface and you know, your space time topology is just that Cauchy hypersurface cross uh, the real line. And uh, you, you know, we're used to talking, thinking about it. So one of the sort of worrying things, or I would say more annoying things is that you, how do we get that spatial information out? It's not at all obvious, but we can do some things. And I want to tell you what we can do. So one thing that you ask is, so, okay, so tell me what a spatial hypersurface is, because I know that there are relations between points, but what should a spatial hypersurface be? Obviously, things that are space-like related don't have relations between them. So things, elements that are unrelated to each other are mutually unrelated to each other are the equivalent of a spatial hypersurface. If you want something that's like a Cauchy hypersurface, then you also want it to be maximum. You want to include as many points into that set as you possibly can, because then everything is either to its future or to its past, okay? So you don't have any other elements. And so this object, which we call an anti-chain, so the ones that we had earlier, these guys here, we call chains, right? We call these chains. And these, because there's no relation between them, we call them anti-chains, okay? So this blue object here is an anti-chain, okay? This blue one here is an anti-chain. And that's where we're gonna start off from. That's our analog of a Cauchy hypersurface and uh, if it's maximum. And the interesting thing, of course, is that it's unfortunately not quite Cauchy because even though it divides the causal set into the past and its future, and then you, know, you have this uh, anti-chain in between, it doesn't capture all the relations. And that's because of non-locality. And here's an example of that. And it's what we call Cauchy Civ. It lets a lot of information through. So it isn't really like a summary of the past as a Cauchy hypersurface is and should be. Nevertheless, we can do a little, you can improve on this situation by borrowing information from the region around that anti-chain. If I just take these, this anti-chain, okay? Let me um, choose. Uh, so I noticed first of all, okay, there are relations here, there and everywhere. But because of the nature of the anti-chain, because there are things that are not related to each other, there's no relation between them. There's just dust. There's no information. If I just took that anti-chain and gave it to you, you'd say, what can I do with this? It has no structure on it. The only topology I can put on it is a trivial or a discrete topology, okay? And the idea then is to borrow information because the causal structure is there. It's telling you how these elements are related to things above it and they're related to things below it. And can I use that relational information to deduce information about that spatial hypersurface? And that's what we do. We look at a thickening and we thicken in a way that's consistent with the way we think in terms of volumes, okay? in terms of space-time volumes or just number in the case of... Uh, so volume thickening in the continuum would be where you uh, look at any elements which you go up to. So here we thicken. So here's, a, here's the anti-chain, the original anti-chain. And then you go up. So in the, in the diagram below, you basically go up and you say, well, I want to include all elements to its future whose past. So if I wanted to draw its past here, that the number of elements in that past are only, and then when I say past that is up to that anti-chain, are just V and no more than V, okay? So all those I will include. And then I say, well, let's go to another value. And then I say this one, this orange ones are for the next, for another value of thickening and so on. And I will include also the green, green ones in that, okay? So just to sort of distinguish that you will be adding in more and more as you go up to larger and larger volumes. So this is a way of thinking about, in fact, even how Cauchy hypersurfaces themselves in the continuum can grow. Uh, okay. Excuse me, is it like yeah. band structure? I mean, like uh, you build it like, not like a line, but like a band, is it? 
Right. So it looks like a band structure, but all I'm doing is I've got a set of elements. Now I've got all its future elements and I'm telling you that, okay, this future element mm -hmm. up to this point. So if I look at, I'm looking at its past up to this point. Okay. I don't look at the past of the anti-chain. Okay. So up to this anti-chain, I look at the volume, the number of elements that are there. Okay. okay. And yeah. I label each element to the future by that volume. Then I say, let me collect all of the ones which have volume less than or equal to some value V. Okay, whatever that is. Okay. Right? So I thicken that way. And can I can do that in the continuum as well. Okay. Uh, can, I, can I think of like uh, entangled particles uh, having um, uh, something like uh, if I have two entangled particles and then uh, um, they, they are like separated like uh, space like let's say it, one is beyond the horizon and one is in, within the horizon, then uh, um, uh, is it something like that? I mean, can we, can we use... See, uh, yeah, the, the thing here is that I'm still talking about just Lorenzian geometry. We've not okay. come to the quantum theory yet. And in fact, in the quantum theory, such issues are, of course, important. How do we talk about Bell causality and entanglement? And those are much more subtle questions here. I'm talking just kinematically. We okay. just have causal structure and that okay. causal structure is not fluctuating. There's no quantum theory here yet. We're just talking about the kinematic structure of the theory. We're talking about in Lorentzian geometry, how do we discretize and how do we get our geometric structure and information? Okay, okay. so yeah. thanks. Yeah. And I will talk about entanglement. If I, you know, I'm just gonna go on and on forever, so. <laughs> So I apologize to you. This slide is uh, in memory of uh, a dear friend, uh, M.S. Narsiman, Professor M.S. Narsiman, who passed away recently. Um, because uh, when I first came to the Raman Research Institute, uh, I needed help on a mathematics paper that was in French and Narsiman was despite being such an esteemed mathematician, he was kind enough to talk to me and even translated the paper for me. And it was an extremely important part of my, uh, my research career. So I, you know, I can't help but think about him. He passed away very recently. So I have great memories of him and this is just dedicated to his memory. Um, this was also, by the way, in my talk to, for Penrose tribute, I had the same slide. Um, so the one of the other things that you can do from this thickened thing is to construct information about the homology of the hypersurface. Again, I can go into this in some detail, but the idea is essentially that these light cones, okay, just think about it like this. We think of these light cones on that hypersurface, they, they have, you know, their impressions on the light the beams, I would like to call them the beams on the hypersurface. Now those beams, they intersect each other. That intersection provides for me enough information and connectivity for me to be able to construct then a, what is called a simplicial complex. It's called a nerve simplicial complex. Once I have a nerve simplicial complex, I can construct the homology of this object. And by doing that, I can reconstruct a very important part of the spatial topology of the causal set, of the space-time from the causal set, okay? Um, I can also, much more recently, we've used similar structure to try to get spatial distance functions using just these light cones, okay? And here, if I, I'd like to think about it like it was the following. Suppose I had a curved space, a uh, curved region, and here's a, here's a book with a curved region, and I take a cone. If I take too big a cone, that's not a good idea, but I take a small enough cone, and I patch it up like that. And that cone, of course, gives me a circle, and I can use that to determine the distance function mm -hmm. on this. And that's really essentially what one is doing. And um, when you do that, what you find is also that uh, you get this very interesting thing that in when it's very small, when, when the points are very close to each other, you have this regime where the distance does not match the continuum distance at all. It's much larger. And this is what we call a region of asymptotic silence where, you know, the standard things that you think of 
of how distance should behave near the discreteness scales is not how it behaves, even in this continuum approximation without taking quantum theory into account, none of that. This is just the kinematic structure of the theory. Okay. Uh, finally, we also have the Gibbons Hawking York boundary term, which we can construct similarly using a thickening of this sort. Okay. And all of this, just to say, okay, I think uh, some, okay, sorry, I had some funny. Uh, no, I'm messing this up. Okay. So all of this goes to say that even though I don't have, I can't prove the fundamental conjecture of the theory, which is that there should be a unique space time to which a causal set comes, is approximated by, all of these suggest and give very strong evidence for that conjecture. There is also a very important result, which is the Benin-Casa-Dalka Glasser action, which is basically asking, how do we think of the Einstein-Hilbert action? Because ultimately, when we want to construct the dynamics, this action is very important. How will we construct the Einstein-Hilbert action? So in when you have simplicial complexes and we have the Reggie action, so people have done work, they know that the Reggie action is a good way of uh, a, a good discretization for simplicial complexes. Um, but we know that that's not the right way to go for a causal set because we don't have finite number of vertices. The graph has this very non-local property. So one has to go to a completely different, uh, adopt a completely different approach. And that again goes back to counting, but now you count the following. And here are, here's uh, the example that if I have a point here, I count its nearest neighbors, how many nearest neighbors I have, okay? That's without anything in between. Then I count the next nearest neighbor, okay? This has one point in between. Then I count the number of, oops, sorry, again. <laughs> then I count the number of next to next neighbor, which has two points in between, and, but because that means that I have two different configurations which will contribute. So counting those next to next to nearest neighbors for every element in the causal set, and then adding them up in this alternating sum, which is very important because funnily enough and interestingly enough, perhaps not funnily enough, but interestingly enough, they all cancel out so that what you get is finite answers for the known cases that we have studied. Um, that's all you need. You just count and you get the einstein hilbert action, which basically, in other words, when you take the continuum limit, it gives you back the einstein hilbert action plus boundary terms the boundary terms of the Gibbon Hawking York terms that we've got are for spatial boundaries. And so that's something you would add on to it and so on and so forth, okay? So just to summarize this part is that despite being discrete causal sets that are approximated by space-time manifolds contain a lot, if not all of the relevant continuum geometry and topology. The question is, what, what do you mean by relevant? It means that if I'm going to scales below the discreteness scale, which is below the Planck scale, why should I bother about structure, right? And that's the approach, that there is no structure below the Planck scale, that there is a fundamental cutoff. And so that's all. And the point is that even if you did that, you still have huge amount of information just coming from the causal relations in the causal set. And we have discreteness with Lorentz invariance Non-locality is a prediction of the theory. And I think that from the continuum perspective, what it does is it gives you a way of understanding Lorentzian geometry from the causal structure vantage point. We can also do quantum fields and field theory on causal sets. And I think I'll just skip this part. We have ways of studying space-time entanglement entropy. We've been doing recently been studying this um, in various approximations uh, like dissiter space-time as well as in um, high dimensional, you know, in, in four dimensional Minkowski causal diamonds and so on. But I, again, I, sh I won't go into this at all. And that's an entanglement that's coming from a quantum field living on a classical causal set, okay? So that entanglement is not coming from quantum, from the quantum theory of causal sets. So I will move over to that, the question of how do we construct a quantum dynamics for causal sets? And I will be kind and I'll try to finish this within the next 10 minutes. Um, 
There is one approach, which is a continuum inspired approach, and you'll see other, which is a more fundamental approach, which talks about growing causal set elements. This is what we call sequential growth. It's a growth of causal set elements that respects causality. So the continuum inspired approach is, of course, we're trying to construct a partition function where you sum over all causal sets. So instead of summing over all space times, you sum over all causal sets weighted by the Einstein Hilbert e to the i s, where s is the Einstein Hilbert action. Okay, but now you're summing over some space of causal sets. Question, of course, is what space of causal sets? Question is what action to use when, etc. Okay, so let's look at the space of n element causal sets when n is very large. Okay, and this was studied by mathematicians Kleitman and Rothschild in 1975. And they found that this space that we have picked inadvertently, I guess, to be our space of quantum gravity is actually just totally swamped out, dominated by objects like this, which are very, oops, sorry, which are very non-manifold like. And this, so these are, to, are do, dominant and it was later shown by Deepak Dhar, who's of course a very well-known a uh, statmec uh, person at uh, professor of statistical physics who was until recently at uh, um, the yeah. IFR. yes yeah so when you have mentioned about partition function yes so there is a phase i so that means it's basically highly oscillating type yes mm -hmm. yeah. so how you manage to get uh, a stabilize some out of this highly oscillating quantity because as far as I know, like once we calculate the partition function, you know, some people used to do in a Euclidean signature, even also in the Euclidean signature, people need to find out saddle points. Yes. Hmm. Even Lorentzian signature, people used to calculate that. So here, exact uh, partition function can be calculated or some uh, approximate. Mm. No. So what we can do, so I'll explain to you what we can do with it. And so I'll, I'll just go over it. But so that's exactly, I'll tell you what we can do and what we can't do yet. And what are sort of the challenges that we have. So with quantum dynamics, I will be much less assertive about what we can do because we're still exploring. Many of these are very hard questions, but I'd like to explain to you why they're specifically hard in this context, okay? So you're yeah. right that to find the full partition function, but also once you find the partition function, you have to ask the question, what do I want to do with the partition function? Yeah. I want to be able to calculate, you know, expectation values of observables. Now you have to ask the question, what are the right observables in quantum gravity? So, so you know, you kind of keep going. They, these are very hard questions, uh, but we have a very, uh, a particular way of dealing and asking these questions, whether we're successful or not, is something that we'll only see in the future. But I'll try to explain to you what it is and how far we get to what we're doing um, without violating any of the principles we've started off with, okay? So what I wanted to say is that if I just looked at, so in the partition function, there are two things. One is this guy here, and one is the actual choice of the action. So I'm asking the question, let's just look at the space of uh, causal sets and ask if I didn't have, if my action was, just one, I mean, if it was zero, so I had no action whatsoever. So I just had a uniform measure in the partition option. I can think of this as a choice of measure, right? Some choice of measure. If I just took the uniform measure, what does it look like? And that's a fair enough question to ask. And if you ask that question, for example, in quantum mechanics, we know that the set of parts that you have in the path integral formulation, the set of parts, most of them, it's highly dominated by things without using the action, just entropic domination is by things that are highly, highly, are just continuous, right? That's the space of parts. They're not even, right? I mean, they're continuous, but not differentiable. It depends again, whether you're looking at uh, which particular, yeah. So you can, of course, expand the space of parts to things that are not even continuous, but were piecewise continuous and so on and so forth. So that is what I'm asking. I'm saying, let's look at that space and ask, what are we up against? And that's what the work of Kleitman and Rothschild and later Deepak was to show that 
you have a huge dominance and two to the n squared upon four dominance of these KR posets and a subleading dominance of these other layered posets. These are not like continuum space times because they only have a finite number of very few time steps, if you like. That's already one way to see it, but there's multiple ways we can use our all the geometric reconstruction tools we had earlier to show that these will have fractional dimension. They will have no proper, they, they will not look like the continuum in any way that we recognize, even from the causal set perspective. So these are not like manifolds at all, and they dominate the space, okay? So here's, a, here's sort of a figure, uh, sort of a symbolic way of putting it, largely this purple area. So if omega n is a gray thing, purple area occupies most of it. And here's a harder question because and you asked about dimension, is that in this, because I have not said anything about, I said any causal set is allowed in here of number of, in this case, n is some number which is finite, but it is large enough. In that space can, are contain all causal sets of all possible dimension, continuum dimension as well. So in other words, I've included all space-time dimensions of the continuum as well. So this is a very, very hard task that one is set out to do. And this is what we try to tackle in bits and pieces in this approach, okay? The first approach, which I will talk about, is a Lorenzian statistical geometry approach, which, as you would understand, in a causal set, you can't do a weak rotation because there's no meaning. The order cannot be weak rotated away. There's an order and that's about it. What you can do is to introduce an analytic continuation parameter, which is what we do. And when you do that, you convert a, a Lorenzian a quantum theory into a Lorenzian statistical theory. And once you do that, then you can attack this question of the partition function from using Monte, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. And because n is finite, many of the issues that you worry about are not present here. So this is one thing that we did, and we actually looked at uh, without uh, putting in any uh, action. So when you take beta equal to zero, that's a uniform case. Uh, this is a very hard question. Essentially, I want to say that even if you take Monte Carlo methods and you use them, uh, it's very, very computer intensive. And now this idea, this thing of God non-locality is a great, is a huge uh, problem for thermalization. Nevertheless, we, we examined the case when there is no action and we found that, that you do recover the asymptotic regime. But at this point, we're still struggling with these questions and how to, uh, this is sort of the new thing when I say it's ongoing, this is an idea that's been around that I started thinking about several years ago, but due to lack of time, have not really pursued. Hopefully, sometime this year, we will be able to pursue it, okay? Um, but one thing that we were able to do, and this is something I did in 2011, so 10 years ago, more than that, actually, uh, in 2010, uh, which is to say, okay, I can't tackle the whole set. Let me look at a dimensional reduction. Uh, I will specify the dimension and I will look at that space of causal sets because this is what you do in any, whether you're doing dynamical triangulations or causal dynamical triangulation, you fix the dimension and then you work with those structures. So you can do something similar in causal sets. We fix the dimension to two and we studied the system extensively. And we found that there is a first order phase transition that the system undergoes. It goes through a continuum phase, which is this phase here, okay? And it transitions then to a very ordered, what sort of seems like a very ordered, but a very non-manifold phase, which is, which we called a crystalline phase because it did so much of order. And we also constructed, the we've done a finite, finite and analysis, finite, uh, uh, oh my goodness, my words are uh, getting confused, but I, uh, you know, uh, basically uh, asymptotic analysis of this to show that uh, our results were not dependent on, were, you know, independent of size, finite size scaling, sorry, 
We did an entire analysis of the system. And we also studied the Hartle Hawking wave function for this. And we found something very cute, which I would love to make it into a big deal, but it can't be made into a big deal because it's just two dimensions, which is that we found a phase in which the Hartle Hawking wave function is beautifully peaked in one phase on the continuum. And in the other phase on this particular kind of, this particular class of, uh, of, uh, of causal sets, which has the property of being very, very homogeneous from the causal perspective. So I think it's very cute. And perhaps in, a, in the final theory, there will be some element of this which pops up, but it's very hard to surmise something more general from this. We have more recently, sorry. I have some questions here. So usually once you uh, write down the partition function in terms of its statistical ensemble, you, we usually write as like uh, e to the power uh, minus beta h tris, thermal tris. So this Hamiltonian, is it like your, uh, this SDC? So yeah, so we don't use a Hamilton. We're using the, we're using the partition function for the, it's the action. It's a full action. Okay. Like I said, Hamiltonian and spatial and, you know, dividing space into, dividing into space and time doesn't work well in a causal set. So we have to use a path integral approach. But okay. here we're doing a statistical path integral approach. Okay. 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 And we're hoping to learn something about the structure of the theory. Um, again, the lessons learned are not something that we can, you know, declare as victories of over quantum gravity. But I think they teach us something, something, and we have to be modest about these. Um, we also, more, much more recently, uh, we published this in 2019 was to generalize this to higher dimension as well as to a topology, which is uh, S1 cross R, as well as to T2 cross R. And we could see very similar behavior of the, this first order phase transition. This phase transition, what is the order parameter? So the order parameter is any of the observables that you pick for me. And we had, we looked at various, in the 2D case, we looked at a large slew of observables. An observable here is an order invariant. So something that doesn't care about labels on the causal set elements. Okay. Uh, an example of that is a number of relations mm. that you have. And what we call the ordering fraction, which is the number of relations divided by the number of possible relations on N elements, which is NC2. That ratio becomes an interesting observable because it's also related to the flat space-time dimension. Another one is just the action itself. Another one is counting the number of links. Another one is counting the height of the causal set. So we look at any of these and we look at what happens to that. And again, another, another obvious one is the action itself. So with sure. all of these, we see all of these, we see a phase transition. I haven't shown it here, but I mean, I'm happy to share it with uh, you later. I'm asking because I'm trying to con connect with the known other ideas. So uh -huh. I'm asking. Yeah. The important thing is that what we found with our finite size scaling is that it's not a second order phase transition, oh, okay, okay. which to us is not very disturbing because we're not interested in the continuum approximation per se, in the continuum limit per se, but it may be telling us something about first order phase transitions in the early universe and so on and so forth. It's very hard to speculate uh, from that perspective, but I think it's interesting that we find it and it's fairly ubiquitous. Sure, sure. Um, um, so one thing that we have done also is to look at the full, like the, the Lorentzian path integral. So in other words, put in the eye, don't go into the, so now we have to look at this from an analytic perspective. There's no way of putting this on the computer. And one thing that was done by uh, Steve Carlip and his student, uh, I forget his first name, but Loomis is his last name, was to say, well, let's look at how well the uh, action can do this uh, Benincasa darker glasser action. How well does it do? It's a discrete action. And we know that uh, along with the three layer Posets, which are very numerous, which are these KR posets. There are also the subleading ones are these bilayer posets. They just have two layers. 
everything is either in one or the other. And they said, let's just look at that and let's look at the partition function and split it up into one that is just the bilayer coset and ask, well, does this thing suppress these highly entropic objects? What they found is that in fact, it does. In D equal to four, for example, it does when you have the uh, cutoff is this much times the Planck length, which I think is very interesting. And D equal to two, there's no suppression because there is no fundamental cutoff scale. Okay. And so here's a very interesting thing that you just take this action and then you've got, you're able to show that this, and they've done a saddle point approximation of this. What we did last year was we said, okay, if that's the case, what, why not look at the next, the most dominant case, which is a KR process. And we found that if we just restricted to counting links for the action, what we call the link action, which is actually a fairly good approximation to the full action in this regime. And that's something that we're studying to make that statement actually precise. We find that even the KR posets are suppressed. So we find if I go back to this picture that really these guys are out. If I, if I do a saddle point approximation, I find that it's highly suppressed. These things are highly suppressed by the action. So I think that's actually very good progress for us. And um, it tells us that we're perhaps on the right track. Um, and I'll finally finish and I really apologize. This is the longest talk I've ever given, but I'm very happy giving it because it allows me to say all the things that I would like to say uh, without having to you know, cut off my talk and apologize to those of you who've fallen asleep. Um, and that is that, how do we do quantum cosmology with causal sets from a more fundamental perspective? And this is the sequential growth paradigm of Rideout and Sorkin. And it's a very beautiful idea, which is that, okay, we're thinking of constructing partition functions and so on, and it's very continuum inspired. But if you just take the fact that, okay, we have space-time atoms, what is the most fundamental kind of dynamics you might want to construct? And they came up with this idea that if you have uh, you know, if you take the simplest possible initial condition, which is there is one particle and that's your, this here. So you say there exists one particle. And so it is born. You have to have that. You have to have at least one particle born or one event, this causal set event. Then you say the next element that comes in can occur either to its future, okay? or be unrelated to it. You cannot attach it to the past. This is just not allowed, okay? So that I'm not going to allow. I'm just going to allow that it's either attached to its future. So it's a causal growth that I allow. And I give it probabilities that it can happen this way or it can happen this way. And what you construct then is a, is a random walk or a Markov chain, a Markov process by which you attach more and more elements. So for example, if I look at this, I've attached the third element, I've taken this one and I've attached the third element to the future of this element here. And that gives me a full chain, or I can attach it just to the future of this red element, but not to that one and so on and so forth. And I get a bunch of possibilities. But now if I look at it, I notice the following. I look at this one, I look at this one, and I look at this one. These three that I've, link to, right, are really one and the same post set. If I remove the coloring, the coloring here was when they appear. And that to me is labeling. And that to me is not covariant. What is covariant from the causal set perspective is something that's label in invariant or label independent. And so the object that I want to ascribe physicality to is the one without any labels. And it's this gray object here. So I would like to construct, and this is what they did. They constructed classical dynamics, which are based entirely on these, um, on such a construction of growth, but which satisfy causal evolution, covariance in the sense that I've mentioned, because it shouldn't matter how that causal set, that intermediate causal set got born. The probability for that should be invariant under whichever path you got that you know, the uncolored version of that. 
And we also satisfy a certain spectator in the independence, which we call Bell causality, and the structure is Markovian. When you do this, this theory simplifies enormously. You get dynamics that is all captured by one. At every stage, you have just one, uh, one uh, parameter, OK? Um, there's a lot to say about this. A uh, very simple example is that of transitive percolation, where everything is captured by uh, one uh, parameter Q. And basically, you can construct an entire dynamics this way. And this is the simplest one. What is very interesting is that they found that when you take an arbitrary dynamics and you allow it to go through what we call bounces, bouncing universe situation, then it, there's sort of an RG flow that takes you to the simplest dynamics, which is out of transitive population. Um, in this remaining time, I'll just very briefly say, and I won't go through the details here, that what is the natural way to think about this is in terms of a measure space where you have the space omega of all past finite causal sets. They're past finite because they've started from a finite process. Um, you have the, what we call an event algebra, which is constructed out of, in a particular way that it will take me an entire talk to discuss, um, and your classical measure. And, and you can construct things like this, and you can construct observable, an observable algebra here. And an observable algebra is simply events or sets in the space of all possible causal sets. The set of causal sets, which is independent of labels. That's what I would call a covariant observable. Okay, it's a very different way of thinking about it. And this is why this will take me an entire you know, lecture or two to explain what we mean by this. The important thing here is that, so covariant observables are things like this, which I've already said. Uh, here are examples. One example of a covariant observable is where the entire causal set you know, collapses to one point and then explodes again, very much like a cosmological bounce. And that's a covariant event because that is totally label invariant. Okay. Um, again, um, so the idea that we want to see, and I will just finish with this by saying that the idea is to take the classical probability space that we have and to quantize it. And where we do it is, sorry, so this circle should have been, <laughs> should have been here. Uh, is to, we keep the same structure. So we actually are quantizing a stochastical, stochastic theory. How do we quantize a stochastic theory? We take the structure of the stochastic theory, which is the standard mathematical structure. And I mean, I know that not every physicist is familiar with this, but nothing I'm saying here is very new. It's a measure space. And the measure space is your sample space, your event algebra, as well as your measure. Instead of that classical probability measure, you want to replace it by what we call a quantum measure. And that is our definition of quantization. And this is in keeping with the idea of decoherence functionals and so on. What is very interesting is that when you do it in a certain way, you can construct from the space of all causal, you know, these past finite causal sets, you can construct a Hilbert space. Okay. And that Hilbert space is what this measure lives on. It's called a vector measure. And you basically want, that is the system that you want to study, okay? There are some technical issues which we have to overcome. And, uh, you know, we, but you can still construct a quantum sequential growth like this and ask uh, simple but physical questions. And I just want to finish by saying that we have found more, very recently last year, we published this work that you can construct quantum sequential models of causal sets where you can, you know, it's a very simple model, but it's a quantum growth model of causal sets, which is in the whole space. So in other words, we've picked a measure which is simple to deal with, but we can talk about it. And in a way that allows us to define covariant events, okay? So you can ask covariant questions. That means that we have a, a quantum theory of causal sets, may not be the quantum theory of gravity, 
a quantum theory of causal sets where you can ask some simple questions. One of them is whether this event happens or not, this originary event that I pointed out, this guy here, which is that there's a single element to the past of all other elements. Very simple question, but we can assign a probability, we can assign a measure to it, and that measure is zero. We can say for these, this event will not happen. Okay, so all of this to sort of su to summarize, we have some understanding of statistical geometry of causal sets using Monte Carlo simulations, some understanding of suppressions of entropic contributions from the action. Uh, and this, those are dimension independent, uh, except for the D equal to two case and the existence of non-trivial covariant quantum sequential growth models. But of course, there's a long way to go. And I'll just end with the slide. Uh, people can ask me questions or we can wind up. I've taken one and a half hours, which is the longest ever in a talk. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Sumati, for this nice talk and the explanations. Uh, I can see only one student that he, he wants to ask any question, that's okay. Yeah, of course. Uh, I have a question. Uh, before that, just I want to give a clap for you for giving such a nice talk and uh, such an elaborative talk. So I just have a question regarding the fact that once you have said regarding uh, the stochastic uh, quantization. So uh, as far as I can remember, in literature, people used to mention that once you stochastically quantize a system, there might be a possibility to, to have a time direction. Okay. And uh, that might be a little bit problem once you do the path integral. People did that. People did that. Like a lot of uh, works are there. Uh, stochastic quantizations, path integrals. People did. Uh, I just forgot the technique people use. But is it the is it the Feynman cuts? Uh... Yeah, 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 yes. The two time, the two time. Uh, yes, yes. Yes. So this is this would be in fact close to what we do because really the quantum measure, what I'm calling the quantum measure, really comes from a decoherence functional. Yes, yes. You can think of it also as from coming from a decoherence functional. Mm -hmm. So in that case, it is in fact a two time. Yes. You know, two time path. Yes. But uh, it it doesn't seem to violate cause. I mean, just by the structure of how we construct it, there's no violation of causality in doing that. I mean, having said that, I really don't. We don't know enough about the theory to say there won't be these problems. To calculate anything more is hard. So, does that answer somewhat your question? Yes. Yes. I mean, maybe that, yeah, so. So is there any question from the guy who is attending Shwarnava? He's silent. No, sir, it's okay. <laughs> Shwarnava is from Mararai, I guess, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, uh, so if not, then uh, thank you again for giving such an elaborative talk and Thank you. That will be very, very helpful for students because this was not talked before uh, in this uh, forum. Uh, so can, can you please comment on some future directions a little bit more where people can work and some okay. other applications? Could you please tell something about sure. that? Sure, I'd be happy to. So one, one direction which I did not talk at all about is uh, phenomenology where you know it is a very important thing a lot of people in quantum gravity feel that we what we're doing is so removed from any phenomena that is good to talk about how the effects of you know discreteness how could it what kind of effects could it have could it have you know even though it's very small the universe is very large so there could be secular effects so things are build up over time which might and the idea of, for example of swerves is exactly that so essentially that if you have a very you know, imagine a discrete setup and you have a particle hopping on it. Now, of course, you can think, how can there be a particle hopping on it? But if you took such models, like, you know, of discreteness and you ask, well, what would happen? Then you find that, so the idea of swerves, for example, is diffusion in momentum space. And 
that means that you go to very high energies very quick and within a certain time scale okay because that's what a diffusion process does but this is in momentum space so so phenomenologically there's lots of i think interesting things lambda itself the fact that lambda might be varying uh, might be varying there's some tensions that people are talking about but i'm not a phenomenology person so i'm you know limited in my work in this area completely what i think is very interesting which i think is from the kinematics perspective is fine looking for more order invariants and you know uh, Lorenzian geometers I was at a meeting very recently with which was a tribute to Penrose and it's very interesting to see how much people in Lorenzian geometry are beginning to ask questions about the structures in Lorenzian geometry which survive low regularity manifolds so uh, they therefore then go on to do many interesting things. They've gone on to doing many interesting things and, and uncovering many new geometric uh, structures. And I think it's a very interesting interface. I'm very find that a very fascinating interface because it what we can do with causal sets, we can get a lot of information out just by discretization. And if even if you forgot it all about about quantum gravity or anything. Why that's interesting is that it, you know, discrete systems are easier to deal with on the computer. So even if I wanted to do something that was essentially Lorenzian, but I didn't want to do, I didn't want to break Lorenz invariance, then the right way to go about it would be to use a discretization of this sort. Nobody has explored that direction. I think it's a very fascinating direction to go. It comes with a lot of difficulties because of non-locality. But I think that it's a really important direction to go uh, in the future, which is apart from quantum gravity. So I just, since you have uh, said that this discretization plays a very significant role in your case. So I just want to make uh, one comment regarding uh, the, these days, one uh, particular area is uh, like uh, doing very well, which is machine learning techniques. So there people uh, used to talk about neural networks and all. Uh, so do you think that like this kind of approaches might be useful to apply with uh, some kind of neural network theories like that? It's, a, it's like big comment, but I'm just asking to like- Yeah, so it's a very good comment. You know, uh, the, like I said, some of the questions we have to ask there, the complexity is very, very high because of non-locality you see when you think about it something like number of relations growing like nc2 n squared really you know so you that's just the number of relations but there can be many every time you in any of these monte carlo simulations you can't do you can't parallelize for example your system because it's so non-local you can't just chop it up into pieces like you would in an ising model and trivially parallelize so people have tried to do some amount of parallelizing, smart parallelization, okay? Uh, my colleague, uh, Will Cunningham, who's brilliant at this. But another thing that he has gone ahead and done is trying to understand if there's a machine learning way of understanding when, what the action is, okay? To calculate the action every time is very, very complicated because of this non-locality. So he's been exploring such things. I'm unfortunately not the person who's a, who works at all on this, uh, but I'm aware that these are possibilities that uh, Will Cunningham as well as Lisa Glaser are, have been looking into to see if there are ways in which we can make things more efficient. Um, and uh, talking about neural networks and so on, these causal sets, uh, you know, de-sitter causal sets, I would say, are apparently kind of the way in which you can model the model the internet very well with them. So there are people who've worked on that. So the sort of unrelated things that unrelated to the, the particular physics that we're interested in here. And of course, here I've also told you what are the other things about that, you know, the future direction. I think dynamics is really taking this quantum measure approach further is very important. Also looking at the suppression, the suppression question is something that I'm working with Steve Carlip about with uh, currently. So um, there are many, uh, many directions. In fact, for every one of them, there's like 10 problems that one can think about. 
So I would encourage, uh, you know, young people who to either to talk to me or talk to my, you know, uh, to Noman who has been working with me, who's finishing and going for a postdoc or to Abhishek who is in his senior year, uh, also at RRI, uh, where perhaps the three people in, in India who work on causal set theory. So, um, you know, please be in touch and, you know, either to talk to me directly or to them and, uh, I'd be happy to talk to people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. But, uh, Thanks, Shantan, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I can't I can't express my happiness at being able to actually finish a talk. <laughs> 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 so thank you for this very I think it's a Russian model, right? Of a very long talk. Yes, yes. It's, yes, it's a good yeah. idea. I think it's, it's nice to have it. It's actually, I'm continuing this for last one year. So uh, I will send a link once your talk will be uploaded, but like you can go to check other talks, whichever. Yes. Happen. Yes. Uh, so it's regularly happening. So if you want to join the series, this will be the link. I'm not changing the link, the Zoom link. Okay. It will be same 6.30 to 9. But it is a uh, Monday or Thursday uh, in each week. But it depends sometimes on the speaker if they are not available or sometimes. Okay, so I will definitely try to check in on the next week. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for this. Sure, sure. Okay, so how do I get out? I'm not sure. No, I, if I cut cut it, then it, it will automatically get out. All right. Okay then.